Oh, yeah. Yes. You know what time it is. Boom shakalaka. Raptors Republic. Time to call the doctor's son. The doctor is in. PhD Steve. A doc's talking rap, stats, and who fast like it's Christmas. E. Dropping points and making specs that you won't be. Lee. Man, get ready to ball. Ball. Cause he's talking hoop. He's got the scoop. Cutting rap. Right Give you the loop. Steve. With a hoop, his brains big spout the size of Ben Wallace's. Lee. Arm raps in public and a tune, so click and read. Ooh, drop your pants and cough, cause the doctor's in, so let's begin. Affiliate to ESPN. PhD Steve. It's Rapcast with PhD Steve on Raptors Republic. Ooh, doctor. Yes, it's me, it's me, it's PhD Steve, and I am back, and this is The Doctor Is In, and this is RaptorsRepublic.com, and we are not only the ESPN.com True Hoop Affiliate, for NBA things related, we are also the home of the NBA champions, world champion Toronto Raptors. So what better way to celebrate than to assemble the worldwide round table? The usual suspects are with me at the Louisiana-Texas borders. My brother Mike. Mike, how are you? He ain't heavy. He's my brother. Uh, I'm doing good, and I'm in Louisiana. I wasn't part of any of the fracas or crime that happened in Toronto during today's parade. Yes, Canadians. Uh, way to go, Canada. Stay classy. Uh, speaking of staying classy in Philly, uh, the brain from the south, uh, gr- hashtag pig farmers. Uh, how, how are we doing, Greg Mason? Being a genius certainly has its advantages. I'd like to say I'm doing great, but I ate. Way too much cheese dip before we started this podcast, so <laughs> I don't know, honestly. Uh, all right, well, and we, we, you, you can hear the, the incoming laugh from the only man who's actually uh, in the city uh, where the parade has happened, where uh, I think like two million people descended on downtown Toronto and chaos uh, reigns. Uh, he's from the Fifth Quarter blog. Uh, Blair Miller, how are you? Yeah, boy! Oh, yeah. What time is it? I'm doing really good. I am fine, thank you. I did not partake of the festivities. Um, I was considering it, and then last night I started seeing news and stuff online about people already starting to camp out at the rally point at the end of the parade at 7 last night, so I just said no. And I'm kind of glad, because I might have gotten shot. Yeah, Um, I I don't think, I mean, let's let's not continue, let's not perpetuate that any farther than what it needs to be. I mean, these are the Anything happens when you jam two million people together in one space. I don't think it matters where it is. Yeah. I mean, so, yes, got, shots were fired. People were shot. That That is not good. Absolutely. And there was a little bit of chaos during the parade while, or during the ceremony while that went on. Uh, but let's also, yeah, let's point out the fact that the city, Toronto, and any city is not designed for that everybody in the city to, to show up at the same spot at the same time. It doesn't, yeah. The infrastructure is not in place to, to, to make that happen. And if you know enough about random theory, uh, you know that if you put that many people together into one space, something stupid it, and random is bound to happen. And that's exactly what did. But we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about more important things like the booing of the premier uh, and, uh, and uh, all, the, all the fun basketball that went on. But let's begin with at the top. Let's start with the championship. Let's start with the champions. Let's go around and share our thoughts on the Raptors winning the NBA title. We'll talk a little bit about the parade because it's part of the the whole process. And we'll talk about the the playoff run, the season that was, and maybe even the season that's still to come. But at the very forefront, the, the headline is Toronto Raptors world champs. Blair, what are your thoughts? Um... I couldn't be happier for the city of Toronto as a whole, or I guess you could say Canada, since we tend to blur the two together, especially south of the border when we think about the sports fandom. Um, I have jokingly called them the Cleveland of the North before, and it has been, it's been 26 years since the Blue Jays won a World Series, so um, they've waited a long, long time, and there's been a number of heartbreaking moments along the way, so I was just so happy to see that happen. Um, and to see it done with, uh, I'll probably get into more detail later, but to see it get it done with, um, it might sound corny, but I don't think it's, I don't think it is, nor should it necessarily be taken for granted that this is a team structured in a multicultural fashion, emblematic of the country that it's in. And that's really cool to see too. 
Yeah, and the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, was at the uh, rally or the assembly. Um, I guess what would be today when we're recording this for Toronto fans, it's actually tomorrow in Australia, and I don't know when you're actually going to listen to it, but he was at the rally, and that was a comment that he made. He spoke to the multicultural facet of, of the team and how it definitely represented the Canadian spirit and the Canadian and global population. You mentioned 26 years since the Blue Jays uh, won the World Series uh, and the last sort of major title that happened in Toronto. Don't at me, Toronto FC fans. I covered the team. I was at your parade as well. But we're talking about you know the, the major sports leagues in North America. So 26 years since the Jays won. I read a stat the other day that when the Jays won their first World Series, it was actually 26 years from uh, when the, the Maple Leafs won their last Stanley Cup. So yeah. 26 years from now, Maple Leaf fans, you can, you, you'll can you get to celebrate again. Uh, Mike, here's the headline that, that, that you pick up the newspaper. Well, probably not in Louisiana, but in Toronto, they pick up the newspaper. It says, uh, world champions, Toronto Raptors. Uh, what, are your, what, what were your feelings? Well, it was definitely, you know, what we sort of saw from the beginning of, uh, of the series. We also sort of predicted that, you know, the, a, a broken down sort of Warriors team, leads to the Raptors, um, you know, being the best team. And they were the better team. Uh, and you, even the headlines down here in Louisiana, of all places, had said, you know, the Toronto Raptors defeated Golden State. And so it's it's made its way even to the far reaches of the of the Arklatex uh, border area down here. Uh, and, and the Raptors, you know, they, they have star power too, which I think also helped uh, having – you know, Kawhi Leonard made made it easier for teams to sort of you know see who's there. I think if um, if if a different team had been assembled, it might not have might not have made the same impact. Uh, but the Raptors definitely you know this it, is big. It's big for Toronto. You know, think of how big it was with with Vince Carter and what he did. You know, as much as we don't like Vince Carter, as much as I don't care much you know for Vince Carter uh, and how he left and and what he did. You know, but he he did turn a lot of people towards basketball not only in the city but in the country itself and this will only have the same sort of effect and it's going to grow basketball in Canada and I think that's one of the most beautiful things for this yeah absolutely the game will continue to grow um, one thing I can I can say for sure is that that I mean 26 years ago there was an, an entire uh, you know group of kids who took the day off and went to the Toronto Blue Jays uh, parade when the Blue Jays won. And, uh, you know, I I wasn't a kid. I was a, a teenager or late in my late teens at that time. But I do remember um, taking the day off school. I remember going to the Blue Jays parade. I remember being in the Sky Dome, uh, which is now the Rogers Center, uh, where it ended for the rally uh, when they, you know, and I, and I, it was an inspiring moment, I think, for young athletes or, or people interested in sport uh, across Canada, and even those maybe who weren't deeply invested in it. It wasn't long after Toronto gets an NBA franchise, and you know, and then we get a, couple, a little bit later on, Vince Carter emerges, and we get sort of Vince Sanity, and what we have is sort of the growing of a different type of sport culture. And so now you have fast forward, you know, 26 years from the Blue Jays winning, you have people who are in their 30s and 40s who are parents all right who were kids or who were teenagers when the last title was won here and they take their kids out of school and they bring them down and so you know it's, it's, it's like the 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 growth and, and, and perpetuation of like ongoing the ongoing uh, emergence of uh the, you know the next generation of athletes and sport culture in this country and i think it's uh, quite uh spectacular greg mason Headlines in Philadelphia, I'm sure when you open up the, the, the morning newspaper, read um, Philadelphia narrowly misses world title after uh, <laughs> Luke, Luke's seventh game shot by Kawhi Leonard denies the Sixers uh, of opportunity to beat up on broken down Golden State. Correct? Incorrect? Uh, what, what was the thought? There? Uh, very close to correct, actually. There, there's a lot of talk of like it being a foregone conclusion that since – you know, they play Toronto so close, then they would therefore stomp Milwaukee and and uh, Golden State. So not that far off from the truth. Well, I, I do think Philadelphia played really well, and maybe we can talk a little bit about that series I mean, when we go through the, the playoffs as being really the the, 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 
the, the melting point or the meshing point of this team where we really saw what their character looked like. What were your thoughts, though, Greg, on on watching the the, the Raptors win? I mean, like Mike and, and Blair and I are all Toronto born, so we grew up, I guess, in liking other teams because there wasn't an NBA team in Toronto, but then eventually adopting it as our home team. You've sort of come at it from a different way. I, I know you're a, a big Dirk fan and a Mavs fan, and you, you started working with us in Raptors Republic and I guess sort of came to came to the, the team maybe through Raptors Republic. And then I know you did some work with the Milwaukee Bucks um, site for a while as well, and you've, you know, you've covered uh, multiple spaces because – you're living in Philly. You went to school in Florida. Before that, I think you went to school in Carolina, and uh, and and you you are from pig farmer country, if I'm correct as well, right? So I mean, like we have, we have, we have like a whole uh, so 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 maybe a good question is like, how did you come to the to the Raptors being your team, and what it, and what did it feel like to watch them win? Um, I say okay, so a couple of things, yeah, definitely, um, working with you guys and and. And all that has really developed, has turned me into a Raptors fan, but I don't pretend to be a lifelong Raptors fan. And I, I kind of feel like my perspective on this pod is a little bit more as a as an outsider looking in, but someone who's over the years grown very sincerely attached to the team and, and respected the fandom of, of Toronto Raptors fans, of Canadian basketball fans, and um, just the... I don't know. I, I think it's a, an extremely exciting moment for Canadian basketball in general, particularly Toronto. Um, of course, this would be the culmination. You know, the Raptors winning would be a culmination of something. But there's been a movement going on when it comes to Canadian basketball, particularly Toronto, for for a minute now. There's there's so much talent coming out of Toronto. Uh Coming out of Canada with with Jamal Murray, R.J. Barrett, uh, Shai Alexander, you know, name after name. So it's there's already just this really exciting moment for basketball being a beloved sport in Canada and and Canada known as producing great players. So that's really exciting. Um, I also think this season as a whole was was a cool one for the NBA in the sense that um, the very best GMs emerged as superstars this year in the sense that like obviously Masai Ujiri, but also John Horst in Milwaukee, Sean Marks in Brooklyn um, guys who, who built teams not in your sort of superstars teaming up kind of way, but more in the, uh, just really building a, a wonderful team and, and showing there's more than one way to skin a cat. And, you know, a lot of these teams emerge playing team basketball, efficient basketball this year. And it, and it showed a pathway, obviously, to get to the upper, upper echelon. You need that really top tier player like Giannis or Kawhi. Uh, it's what Brooke and probably lacks, but it goes to show you don't have to have guys teaming up or it being a totally desired free agent look uh, destination to uh, build a really great basketball team that can win a championship. And so for me, as someone who's just loves the game and has loved the NBA for a long time, uh, that's that was a really exciting part of the season for me. And the Raptors themselves, it's just such a feel good story because, again, there's a it was just a team that was really built well with really high character players. And, and it was just so much fun to see. And, and and as a sort of pure NBA fan, it was really exciting to see a team that was sort of built from the ground up, rise up and win the championship. Canada's team, a hundred percent. I mean, not something I would have thought you'd actually say, I mean, I know we've watched the the country rally around the Raptors, and maybe because there's not other regional teams anywhere else in the country, it was easy to latch on. But Toronto is usually, uh, I guess, like a hated city throughout the rest of the country, or certainly seen as something that is a little bit, you know, them versus us uh, in many other parts across the country. So it's interesting to hear, you, you know, called as Canada's team now, but I understand the, the reason why. To your point of the growth of basketball in Canada, let me simply say, uh, outside of American-born players, 
There is no country that has more players in the NBA last season, the season that just ended, than Canada. So, uh, I mean, that, that's a pretty cool thing to think about. 20, 25 years in, not only do we find ourselves now as hoisting the, the Larry OB, uh, I love that, by the way, the, the Larry OB in, in Canada, but also, you know, you see it about being more than just the, the Toronto Raptors. The game itself has has found its way into uh, you know the culture of, of in the fabric of Canadians. There are more Canadians playing basketball than there are playing hockey, registered in youth sport. And basketball is second only to soccer as far as youth sport participation across the country of Canada. And those are all hashtag facts. You can look them up. Uh, and I also like the point you make, Greg, about the maybe maybe this speaks to the changing nature of the NBA, and we'll get to this in a little bit when we talk about what happened to Kevin Durant, Clay Thompson in the NBA Finals, what this means for the joining of superstars and teams. Of course, Anthony Davis now going to the Lakers. I think we'll probably talk about that at some point in time today as well. And uh, you know. Does this Raptors team signal a move away from the megastars where everybody teams up together to, to win titles? Or is this going to be you know, uh, a title that's remembered more like Dirk's title with Dallas or Chauncey Billups and the Pistons where it's the exception uh, to, to the rule? But let's talk a little bit more about the championship Raptors first before we bounce around the league and look at some of the other stories that are you know percolating and coming out of the, the NBA Finals. I want to talk about how impressive the Raptors victory was so a lot of the narrative is about no Kevin Durant and then Clay gets injured etc et but I want to bring up a couple different points and I want to I want to use these as a starting uh, uh, starting spot for just announcing just how impressive this victory was so we know that the Golden State Warriors were in their fifth straight final which had we hadn't seen in the NBA since the Celtics uh, you know five decades ago, six decades ago. I, hold on, I can't do math. Almost seven decades ago. All right, so I mean, we're talking a long time since, we, since we've had this type of set of experience. But here's what I find most impressive, is that the Raptors won four games to beat the champs, but won three of them at Oracle. Three games on the road. Really very challenging to, to happen. Doesn't happen very often. Uh, if we go back and look at M in, in the NBA Finals history, uh, it, it's happened a couple of the times. The Bulls did it once. The Pistons did it once. Um, you know, but but we don't see that very often. Blair, tell me a little bit, maybe in your in your ideas around just how impressive taking three games on the road from the champs is, uh, and how much more I think that maybe if you agree with me, that should be part of the narrative of this Raptors team. Uh, I think. I think it's very impressive, um, especially when you consider, as you mentioned, the pedigree of the opponent, that they were, you know, we can argue about whether they were a dynasty or not, but they've done something in finals appearances consecutively that hasn't been seen since the dynasty, if you want to call it that. Um, also, <clears throat> I think it does speak towards, um, it should be a more important narrative for the Raptors' accomplishments, not just because it was the Golden State Warriors. Also, there's the fact that we'd brought up before that it was happening in the final hurrah at Oracle, which in theory should post a larger challenge because the Warriors and the fan base will be more um, more into it, if, if, if that's even possible. But also, um, I do think what this speaks towards and dovetails with is what I think was other than the obvious Kawhi Leonard factor, the main thing that got these Raptors through the playoffs, and that was their defense. And we say this in a lot of sports where, like, you know, you bring your you pack your defense on the road, um, especially in adverse situations like that. And this was when I started to really – I'm kind of like Greg. I'm not a devote Raptors fan. I'm more of a basketball fan in general. I have a couple teams I don't – I'd rather watch the paint dry than watch the Rockets play. Um, but I generally just like watching teams. Um, but I really started to warm up to these Raptors a lot after the Gasol trade because I started to, you know, notice what they can do or what they present on defense, right? Because they pick him up, they get a defensive player of the year winner from 2013. They traded for Leonard, who's won it, won it back to back. They have Ibaka, who led people forget he led the league for four straight seasons in OKC and blocks. So he's, you know, he was he was a potential candidate for defensive player of the year back then. Danny Green has the tenacity you get from Spurs being a Spur and in that system. We've got, of course, Kyle Lowry, who leads the team and is up there in the league and drawn charges. And then we've got Van Fleet, who isn't even on the list when I was thinking of it at the time, but he stepped up 
and really answered uh, with the job of defending Steph Curry all finals. And a lot of that, I think, is what helps you on the road, is that defense, the fact that a lot of these guys, even though the team hadn't played together before, most of these guys have been in those situations before with other teams or Lowy with the Raptors. And, uh, yeah, so I think it should fit in the narrative that they took three on the road because it does speak to and enhance, I think, the main characteristics that led this team to success. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, Mike, we did it, Mike, we did a podcast after game two series was tied one, one. And there was this feeling amongst all of us, as we spoke uh, at the worldwide round table here on RaptorsRepublic.com, the ESPN.com true affiliate. Of course, you're listening to us on the doctor is in podcast. Uh, there was this feeling that there was nothing to be scared of going to Oracle. Although historically Oracle was a place to, to, to fear, there was nothing really to be scared of. The, the Raptors could take one at Oracle. And even after they lost game five in what was a bit of a crushing fashion, you know, to be so close to have Kyle Lowry take that shot with the chance to win the title at home, there was still this feeling amongst us as we texted with each other and certainly amongst a, a lot of Raptors fans that it's okay, we can still go to Oracle and win another. Mike, Dating back to 2014 when Golden State started this five-year run that we're talking about, in the playoffs, 45-8 and eight at Oracle. 45-8 and eight at Oracle. 9-2, and 11-3, and 9-0, and 10-1. Oh, and one. But then this year, there seem, they seem to be a little bit susceptible, of course, ending up 6-5 and five with three of those losses to the Raptors. You were always confident, Mike, in, on all of our podcasts that the Raptors could take back um, – home court from Golden State act in Golden State. So why was that? What it, what it, what it, what it was it about this team that that you believed in that they could they could do the job on the road and again just how impressive is it that they went ahead and actually did that? Well, when we did that last podcast and we you know we talked about the 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 win and the loss uh, over in the in Toronto, you know, I I made the point then that you know the Raptors lost game two more than the Warriors won it. And and yes, the Warriors scored 109 points. I, I get that. They scored a lot of points, but they always score a lot of points. But the Raptors scored 104, and they were terrible at shooting. They did an awful job. But what, what gave me hope was, you know, yes, Golden State scored 109 in both of those games, but in both of those games, Steph Curry didn't look like the monster you know, he didn't look like the, this player that was going to, you know, eat up the Raptors. Um, he had, by his standards, a very, I felt, a, a very pedestrian couple of games um, where he was, by the defensive standards of Toronto, really taken out of it. And I think this this goes back to what Blair just said uh, about the uh, the defense uh, of the Raptors. And, you know, this is a, a couple of years uh, running now that the Raptors have been at the top of road wins during the regular season. So this is something, you know, that good defenses do. They keep you in games when you're, you know, slogging through the season uh, away from home. Uh, and this came through for this Raptors team as well. It's, it's defense kept Golden State uh, at bay. And the if you look at the, the two losses that the Raptors had, uh, both of those losses were the Raptors losing more than Golden State winning but that wasn't the narrative uh that that people would tell you you know but uh, going going back for game three and four uh i knew that as long as the raptors shot well uh that their defense would show up and that golden state the way that they were banged up and the way that they've been playing throughout the playoffs up until this point they, they didn't inspire me as invincible like they had years before they looked very tired and very worn out. And when we look at these couple of games, what do we notice? We notice a Raptors win 123-109 and 105-92. They blow them out twice in Oracle. Although it didn't feel like blowouts, you know, considering the firepower that's there. But, but those are blowout losses. They walked into Oracle and they punched him in the mouth twice. So I, I think that, that was one of the reasons why I was confident. If the Raptors could just shoot, their defense is going to keep them in in all of these games. Golden State just doesn't have the bodies uh, or the or the firepower to to keep up with a Raptors team that just doesn't stop coming. I'm glad you mentioned uh, the regular season there, Mike, because in the same five year period, if we add in the regular season during the regular season over the last five years, uh, Golden State 173 and 32 at Oracle. 
So <laughs> we're talking yeah. about a team that, that basically wins five out of every six games that they play at Oracle. And the Raptors went three for three at Oracle in the playoffs. Greg, I still can't get over that the more I think about it. We're talking about 218-42 and 42 since the 2014-2015 season, since the start of that season, since the start of this core together of Clay and Draymond and Steph, uh, you know, with with Steve Kerr as as the head coach. We're talking about a team that's 218-42 and 42 at Oracle, and yet the Raptors uh, this year at Oracle went 5-0. and 0 if we include the two regular season wins as well. I, I mean, it's, for me, it's more than I can actually make sense of. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on just the ability to, again, to, to not just do the, do the business, which they did. They did the business. They won the title. But to do it in such a fashion where you beat the champs and you beat the champs not once, not twice, but thrice on their own home court, uh, on, a, on, on, an, on an arena that, they were sh- that, that they're shutting down, and you sent them home. Uh, I mean, you sent the fans home early on three separate occasions uh, at Oracle. What are your thoughts, Greg? Yeah, I just thought it was amazing the the efficiency of the Raptors. It kind of goes hand in hand with the defense. The the efficiency of the team throughout the season and especially throughout the playoffs was just amazing. You know, some nights it felt like, oh, the shooting is off, blah, 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 blah. But you know, at the end of the day, they still, they they just surgically got the job done. And and the fact that it didn't matter whether it was at home or at the Oracle, you just, they came to play. And that was the really the most impressive thing. You know, in game five, it was the first game they had shot less than 80% from the, from the free throw line, <clears throat> all finals. Uh, I think they shot 72% or 71%, something like that in game five. And they lost by one point. So even that game five, where it was a heartbreaking loss, that was the first game all series where I thought it was just missing a couple free throws that they had been making all series long was the difference. And even that kind of tough game where where Golden State was inspired that that they didn't get it. So just the fact that they were so close, even in the losses, uh, was really impressive to me, and just their their efficiency throughout the season, and particularly throughout the finals, was especially impressive to me. And what it says about how well they're coached, um, how consistently they approach the game, and the chemistry of the team itself. So uh, that was that's a part of the Raptors that really impressed me this year. Was uh, top six in field goal percentage, three-point percentage, top three and free throw percentage. And then throughout the playoffs, it was just surgical efficiency in all the right areas that you need to be efficient when it comes to three-point shooting and free throws. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what's really interesting, Greg, is I don't think we even saw the Raptors play their best basketball uh, at in, in the playoffs, really, at any point, I think the best. I think the, the only time I felt as I was watching the Raptors in this playoff season play at their potential was uh, Game Three uh, against Milwaukee. You know, it, it where really there was very little doubt from the very beginning of the game to the end of the game who the better team was, and it wasn't because of injuries or uh, roster changes or coaching uh, decisions. It was just very clear that this is a team when it fires on all cylinders. Can, can throw punches with anybody else in the league. And people, uh, you know, maybe they forget or they don't want to talk about it, but the Raptors won more. The, the Raptors had home court advantage in the NBA Finals because they won more games than the Golden State Warriors. And the Golden State Warriors were not participating in load management the same way the Raptors were. And if Kawhi had played a full season, maybe they don't get to the Finals. But if he, if, if he plays, you know, of the, the 20-something games that he sits, the Raptors are easily the number one seed in the NBA and, are, and uh, you know, Hard, hard to, to second guess any of those decisions because they and they pay off. But I want to just do this one more time, one more piece on Oracle as we take a trip down memory lane because I think this is pretty funny and it's and it's again worth just highlighting how incredible this is. Okay, so not only the Raptors win three games in the in the finals at Oracle, like I said, a place where over the last five years Golden State's basically won five of every six playoff games that have been played there. The Raptors went five and zero at Oracle, as I told you already. Again. But over the last five years, you know, as I said, 218 and 42, Golden State's record there. Prior to this year, when the Raptors went five and zero at Oracle, 
They had lost 14 straight games at Oracle. Hmm. The last time the Raptors won in Golden State before this season was February 8, 2004, an 84-81 overtime victory. <laughs> Really? Wow. Hold on, I got, it gets better. The leading scorer for the uh, Toronto Raptors in that game was, any guesses? Mo Peterson. Uh, close. Mo Peterson's on the bench in that game. Vince Carter scores 22 points. <clears throat> okay. The leading uh, re- rebounder for the Raptors in that game? Mm. Keon Antonio Parker. Davis. <laughs> good, all good guesses. Danielle Marshall. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sloppy. Hold, hold on, it gets wow. better. Now we're gonna have, now we're gonna have a little bit of fun. The rest of the starting lineup from that day, the starting five: Carter, or, uh, Danielle Marshall, Jalen Rose, Alvin Williams, and stop me when you when you know the answer. Okay, you ready? Stop me when you know the answer. It's not Keon Clark. I wore number thirty-four for the Toronto Raptors. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, you mean Oakley? I was born in the United Kingdom. I attended the University of Illinois Champaign. Illinois Champaign. I was originally drafted by the Vancouver Grizzlies. Oh, is, oh. Oh, did not Big country Brian Reed. <laughs> <laughs> Who <No>. is? <laughs> not David Robert Stoudemire. Archibald. <laughs> <laughs> oh god what? that's hilarious so there i mean so the last time the <laughs> raptors won a game at oracle uh you know in, in oakland robert archibald was uh was, was was part of was part of that that core team and of course that the leading some score, wild stuff sir yeah thanks the leading score for the golden state warriors on that day uh jason richardson wow okay so there's Ooh, a little dunk uh, champ a little uh, uh trip down memory lane let's talk a little bit more about the big names because basketball what makes it such a unique sport and i think one of the reasons why we love it so much is you actually get to see the players right they're not covered by helmets and masks and uh equipment it's like you know they're very uh, accessible and there's not as many players you know and it's a star dominated league and the, the warriors are loved be- or, or hated because they're a star dominated team and in this series there were a lot of stars and a lot of questions around those stars and a lot of injuries that came with those stars as well. And the storylines always continue to revolve around that. Let's go through the stars and talk about the NBA stars from the finals itself. Let's begin with Golden State, who had lots of stars, and then we'll end with Kawhi Leonard, who I, I, I might argue star, his star shines brighter than, than all in the league. Uh, but let's talk about uh, Durant, because we, we didn't talk – uh, at least in a podcast since Durant played. The last time we talked, it wasn't even sure he was going to be able to, uh, to play five or six or seven if he was going to come back. He comes back, he plays 11 minutes scorching the Raptors, and then in minute 12, uh, he, uh, he ruptures his Achilles. What are your thoughts, uh, I mean, I guess just on, on Kevin Durant, on coming back to play, on... Uh, what happens next for Kevin Durant if he stays, if he goes, what it means, and just sort of his his appearance in the finals. Let's go the other way. Let's go to Greg first. Greg, your thoughts on on Durant making an appearance in the finals and and just all, all any, anything you want to say about KD? Um, obviously the injury is terrible, but that goes without saying. Um, he says he wanted to play, and I know he wanted to play. I don't doubt that at all, but I don't know. I don't buy the narrative that he wasn't pressured into playing. Um, I don't know. That article came out by Amic the day before saying there was confusion and blah, 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 but bewilderment in the team and blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't know. It's just a sad story that he rushed back. Um, and now he's going to be out the entirety of next year. Uh, I think, think he's, I think he's going to sign a long-term deal elsewhere. Um, I think it's going to be Brooklyn or New York. Um, And then, yeah, he's just going to nurse that injury next year, but someone's still going to sign him to the max for a four-year deal. Okay. Uh, Mike, what what are your thoughts on Kevin Durant? Well, when we talked about the last pod and I said that he wasn't coming back, um, I said that he would, you know, it sounds like he's got something wrong with his Achilles and that's not an injury that you really want to have and to rupture your Achilles would be really bad. And that's exactly what he did. 
Uh, and you know, I'll, I'll piggyback on what Greg just said, right? Like it, it's a bad injury that you don't want to see that to happen to anybody. Uh, and Durant being 30 going on 31 and players that come back from Achilles injuries are never the same. Like you don't have the same explosiveness. You don't have the same ability to leap and jump. Um, Again, Durant's a, a knockdown shooter. And, you know, before we all forget, during this playoff run, Durant was 50-40-90. He was 51% from the floor, 44% from three, and 90% from the free throw line. And he was averaging 32 points a game before he went down. Like, that, that's the real, you know, assassin of this Golden State team. Um, but I, I'm with Greg. I, I don't see him coming back to Golden State for two reasons. One, they pressured him into playing uh, and getting into this injury. And no matter how much he says otherwise, I know the pressure from his teammates, his coach, the organization, um, especially when the owner, uh, was it the owner of the president who went on, went on TV with Stephen A. Smith and, and said, oh, he'll be back this series. You know, like, so that, uh, I think that's going to push him away, especially because seeing how Kawhi Leonard was, you know, bubble wrapped basically by the Raptors all season to make sure that he was, you know, kept safe. Uh, and, and Durant, I'm sure doesn't feel the same way. Um, but I think the other thing that's, that's probably going to drive him away is um, all that talk uh, going through that Portland series where, you know, we're better as a golden state team. We don't even need someone like Kevin Durant. And I'm sure he heard it all. And I'm sure the, that kind of stuff sticks with you, especially someone as amazing as Kevin Durant to, be you know to to be thought of as someone who's lucky to be on Golden State because he's going to win champions uh, championships, uh, but he he wouldn't win it otherwise sort of anywhere else. He's you know you're you're sort of a, a second or third fiddle in this place. Um, you're not the star, and I think that really shone through um, how badly they needed uh, someone of of his caliber. So I, I'm with Greg. I think he's I think he's gone. Somebody else will happily pay him for a year. Uh, I'm just concerned about what level he'll be able to come back at in terms of driving uh driving and dunking and doing stuff close to the basket but he'll still be a knockdown shooter i don't think that'll ever go away can i yeah. can i jump in real quick sorry Abs- absolutely go ahead oh well you know i i agree with you mike coming back from a ruptured achilles is is a scary is scary business but we saw a 50 percent KD absolutely dominate the Raptors in 11 minutes. So he's such a unique player that his talent is just going to transcend what a lot of normal people can do. So anyways. Absolutely. And he'll get the max contract. And it's, it's not like he's going to go from, you know, Kevin Durant to, to, to Kevon Looney overnight or anything. Right? <laughs> he's he's, you know, like, he's, he's going to come back. He's, he's still probably going to come close to leading the league um, in, uh, in scoring. And, you know, he's still going to be an amazing shooter. Like none of that stuff's going to go away. You're right. His talent will transcend that type of stuff. But when you start getting into your thirties and the injuries pile up, you know, you start losing a step here and there. And this is one of those injuries that, you know, really can affect you. And it, it affected him in, in that 12 minute time period that he was, you know, torching the Raptors, you know, that, that shows you, you know, how, how good he can be, but just, you know, how, how wary was he playing when he was doing that kind of stuff too? You know, we don't know. It's, it's that elite talent that made him so dangerous shooting, but it wasn't like he was just driving around people dunking, you know, 360 ducks and stuff. Um, he was he was his knockdown shooting ability that made him so dangerous against the Raptors that game. Yeah, and that that will still be there. I mean, the shooting doesn't go away. You know what else doesn't go away is wingspan, and uh, you know that that will still be there when he returns. And just to your point, Greg, I, I, which I think is also worth highlighting, and that is we, we when we're talking about guys coming back from injury. Certainly, Achilles is a different type of injury, and there's not a very long list of elite athletes so at the highest level in their sport the highest level performers in their sport who have an injury of this caliber and then return to that highest level again i mean if we go across sports i mean the one that comes to mind right away and maybe blair you'll probably speak to this because i know you're a big nfl guy i mean i think about when uh you know adrian peterson for example right like i mean there's a guy at the at the peak sort of similar age has a really bad injury like that 
uh, but then we see a return to to high level form again afterwards, but just just not sustainable over a long duration of time after you have an injury like that. So I think uh, this is just my opinion. I think we'll see KD return. I think he'll still be incredible because he's one of the best players we've ever seen. That doesn't go away. It's like when Peyton Manning in the NFL had his neck injury. Everyone's like, oh, we'll never see Peyton again. Well, no, he's not the same as you and me. He's like, you know, he's genetically one of you know gifted in a way that that we just aren't. So we can't compare him to normal human beings. However, what happens, I think, is when uh, when they return. From these types of really significant injuries, their ability to sustain that level of greatness maybe just isn't the same. Blair, what are your thoughts on uh, on, on Kevin Durant uh, playing in the finals, making that return, what he looked like, the the significance of the injury, uh, if he comes back, how he comes back, where he comes back, all that stuff. Blair? Yeah, um, I don't know. It was it was obviously kind of heartbreaking. To it's never fun to watch anybody have that happen to them. I I understand the. Uh, I understand the possibility of him being pressured into playing or whatnot, but I don't know that I've gone. I don't know that I go that far with just the facts at hand. It's, it's hard to say. I mean, there were reports of a lot of confusion about the injury from all camps, but I never really read, and I was being attentive about it, read the word impatience or much negativity other than confusion and people just not knowing why it's not ready yet, including Durant. Um, but, uh, and, and I don't know, I don't, what's interesting is this could, you could make an argument, especially with what this summer looms ahead and even the next summer too, and last year, this could be one of the, if not the biggest injury in the history of the league in terms of the ripple effect it might have and whatnot. I, I don't know, I, I, I don't know that I'd be surprised if he said, but just to be devil's advocate, um, he does have a $31.5 million option still available for this year, which is pretty good rehab pay. Um, and I do know that um, after after the game when um, Clay Thompson got hurt in game six, Durant was on the phone calling him. And according to Michael Thompson, uh, Clay's father, he said they have unfinished business was what the two of them were talking about. Now that could mean just with other teams they have unfinished business to come back from injuries from. I don't know. Um, so I, I think what's interesting is I personally have – it's hard to tell. I don't I have no idea what's going to come of this in terms of what decisions he'll make, where he'll go. I do agree with everybody here that he's going to get a max deal. I mean, any team that's willing to flirt with the repeater tax is going to be willing to take on that risk. I mean, look at the risk Houston took on with Chris Paul's contract or Washington with John Wall. And even Kevin Durant coming back off this injury is more appealing than those deals look right now. So I do, I do think there will be teams that will make a move for that or offer it. Um, and I don't worry about his, him as much coming back from his Achilles. I mean, you worry about anyone coming back from an Achilles injury in any sport, especially the taller they get and the longer that joint is and the more leverage it has to sustain. But we're also, it seems like people get better at coming back from Achilles. It seems one of the injuries that are at the forefront of the medical advancements. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but it just seems like people are coming back from that in a lot of sports a bit better. I do, I will maybe, I will point out, I think it was 1992 when Dominique Wilkins blew out his Achilles and he was 32 and I checked, I checked and he put up 29 points a game his first year back and he relies on his athleticism way more than someone like Kevin Durant will. If he comes back, it is diminished at all. I mean, he was already starting to, uh, his pull up still his main game, but he was getting that pirouette turnaround fadeaway jumper. Um, almost like a, like a combination, like if Durant and Jordan's turnaround had a baby is kind of what he does. And if he can still do that, I don't think he'll be in trouble at all. Like I do agree with Mike, you might not see him flying to the hole as aggressively with the power that we've seen in the past, but I'm not necessarily convinced he needs it to justify a max contract. Yeah, I heard uh, I heard Deke on uh, ESPN Radio uh, last week actually talking a little bit about the his return and what he had to go through in order to make it back. And, and that was said, back then. Like, yeah, and he, advancements back then were not what they are now. Yeah, he fully believes that uh, 
Durant will make a, a, a full recovery actually to the same level of play that he's at right now and has even offered his services to Kevin to, you know, if Kevin wants someone to talk to about the process and how to make that happen in his return. You mentioned Clay. Clay goes out with a different injury, uh, the, the, the ACL. And again, can't help but wonder if it's related to the, to the injury that caused him to sit out and miss game three. That's the interesting thing about both these injuries is we don't know if they're connected to the, to the, to the previous injury or not, you know, because both these players were injured and held out and then returned. Did they return too early? Did they put too much, uh, back into it? Or they, are they both just kind of fluke freak, uh, injuries and accidents? Hard to say. I'm not going to include Clay in the star category. I know some people will. Certainly he's, he's a free agent this summer also. And, uh, was up for some big money if he decided to leave Golden State. I know Shaq had said on national television that if he was the general manager, or on his, on his podcast, sorry, that if he was the, made the general manager of the Lakers, he could fix their problems with three moves. The first move would be signing Clay to a, a max contract and bringing him to the to the same uh, you know city where his father uh, you know won won titles and, and then sort of build out from there, getting Kemba Walker as well. That was Shaq's plan, and Clay demonstrated his value throughout the series. You saw what he was able to do. I mean, in the history of the NBA, he's the only player to take uh, at least 200 uh, three-point attempts in, in the finals and shoot over 40% on them. So he's the only player ever to do that. Now, that's part of longevity, but it also speaks to the quality of player that he is. And any team he would go to would make that team better. But I, I don't include him in the same stratosphere as Steph and as KD and as Kawhi. I mean, I think that Clay is very much like, and the, I don't know, maybe you guys want to argue this. I don't know. He's very much the Bosch to LeBron, and, you know, to me, or he's he's the Ray Allen in the, in the big three. Like, he's, he's there, and he plays a very important role, and he's a great player and would be a great player on any team, but I don't think he's in the same category uh, or, or stratosphere as the others. So I want to talk about Steph. But if you want to dispute that or, or, or talk about Clay as we go around, feel free to talk about that. And what I want to say about Steph is just quite simply this. Um, I think Steph is amazing. And I think what makes all the other players look really good is just how good Steph Curry is. I'm going to give you a stat here that might surprise you. And that is um, out of all the NBA finals that we've had, okay, Steph Curry's performance in this year's NBA playoffs from start to finish, okay? Um, he scored uh, 620 points, uh, and that is a top 20 all-time. It's actually the 18th best uh, performance by an individual player in points scored. And just for the record, that's more than any single year of Kevin Durant's, okay? <laughs> so, uh, and, so Steph can still get it done next season will be very interesting and then we'll go we'll, we'll, again we'll go around to all of you guys in a second i think what's interesting is that uh if kevin durant really was pressured to play i think we'll find out when free agency starts because he won't be coming back to golden state but i think if, if he returns to golden state then i think it's time to really end any discussion of him being pressured to play because why would he return to a team doesn't respect him in his body so i think we'll find out there but if clay and kevin durant both return to golden state uh, and take the money golden state's gonna have a really rough year next year and the interesting thing is if this unfinished business part is true they're probably gonna end up maybe potentially with a lottery pick next year and so while they won't have a, a lot of financial wiggle room to go out and sign more stars all mm -hmm. of a sudden in 2020 uh i mean you're, you're looking at a lottery pick for a golden state warriors team that's going to have steph Still under contract, Durant and Clay under contract coming back, all right, and you know potentially if Draymond decides to to, to re up because he'll be an, an unrestricted free agent, Draymond as well. So you'll have the, the core of that team, but now you'll be injecting a whole other uh, extreme level of talent that this team would never ever get their hands on otherwise. So that's another. You know what, that, you know what that reminds me of, Steve? What's if that? I may. Yeah. Um, when David Robinson needed back surgery for the Spurs. Yeah, Tim Duncan. And then they ended, up <laughs> Tim Duncan. They ended up getting Tim Duncan finished, and then they went from worst to first and won the championship in Duncan's rookie year. Yeah, well, and, and the year, but the year before, San Antonio was one of the four it, best teams in the a NBA. We're a 50-win team the year before that, and then Robinson got hurt. Yeah. So, um, so, so I, I think that the core of this Golden State team is actually Steph, and as long as you've got Steph, I mean, you, you can you can rebuild out from there. Uh, but 
well, what do you guys think about Steph's performance in in the in the playoffs? Because it, it does. Lots of people think that he didn't perform, or that he didn't come through, or that he wasn't that good, or he wasn't classic Steph. But as I just told you, I mean, he had he had more points this particular uh, uh, season than any Golden State players ever had in any of their uh, championship runs. <laughs> All right, Mike, to you. Uh, so Steph Curry in, in these playoffs. Um, he did score a lot of points, right? Like he averaged 28 points a game, uh, but he wasn't as effective as he has been before. And he didn't seem as lights out as he has been in, in other playoff rounds. And um, in this time around, you know, he was uh, 38%, I think is what he was shooting from three point land uh, throughout the playoffs. Um, and I think, you know, I, I don't think he's going to get the criticism that he rightly deserves because he's not LeBron James, but LeBron James has gone through this through multiple playoffs where he's had to lead a team that's been injured and star power is gone. uh, And he's not getting the same sort of criticism. Um, It's just, they're sort of given the benefit of the doubt. They're like, Oh, well, well, the Warriors were injured. So I guess that's why all of this is happening. But you know, when LeBron James is without Kyrie Irving and without Kevin Love, it's like, well, why can't James, you know, if he's the best player, why can't he lift them up on, on his shoulders? Uh, sort of thing. So I, I think Steph is getting a little bit of a pass um, where if you know if you want to be the best player, then you're going to have to come with that criticism that you know that you know it, it's really hard to carry a team all by yourself. And LeBron has shown how difficult uh, that is. And I hope people realize that when Steph was left all by himself, you know he, what did he put up? Oh, he put up 48 points against the Raptors in, in game three. And that was second only to LeBron James who put up 51 in a losing effort in the finals. So you can see how, how difficult that is uh, to do. So I, I think, you know, I, I think Steph plays, he, he played great. You know, he played almost to his, his full capabilities, but you know, he's much better when he has other shooters on the floor and someone not uh, draping him uh, throughout the, this, this whole series, at least with the Raptors, the Raptors did a fantastic job of limiting him uh, as best as they could and forcing somebody else on that team uh, to make shots. So I, I think Steph, Steph's legacy will not be tarnished by this, uh, but I think it's time that we actually start comparing his playoff run this year to what LeBron has done to sort of get an idea of how difficult it was for LeBron uh, for all the haters. Okay, all, tr- all true, Mike, but here, real quick. When that, when, at the end of game six, when that ball came out to Steph to shoot a three to win the game. <laughs> tell me you tell me you thought he was going to miss that shot because I won't believe you because I think every Raptors fan, when that ball got swung around with like, what was it, a second to go and ended up in Steph's hands behind the three-point line, I think everybody around the world thought that, that that shot was going in. Interestingly enough about Steph Curry, though, is in the finals, he's not as, uh, as good a three-point shooter as he is in the rest of his career. So, Mike, interesting enough, uh, another point for you, though, that I will we'll add to that, and that is we make a, a lot of talk this year about five straight finals for the Golden State Warriors. I mean, eight straight finals for LeBron before that across two teams. But if we talk about, you know, the the Golden State dynasty, how about just like the LeBron dynasty, like the one player who's bigger than the teams himself? Like he, he went to eight straight finals all by, you know, basically all by himself. Although, you know, that's another point where maybe worth arguing. Blair, what are your thoughts on, uh, on, Ste- on Steph Curry? Um. I, I guess I'm not surprised by that crazy high number of points you put up just to thinking about it because they went they went to six twice and then when they beat Portland he had to do a lot more scoring than was expected before since Durant was out. Um, I do think I have a theory with Steph and you know as you know he's he's one of my favorite players maybe ever I, I, call, I call him a ninja he's just unbelievable but I think. Uh, a part of the problem, you said his final stats, uh, his three, he doesn't shoot the three as well statistically. I I feel like he becomes a bit less consistent at times in the playoffs in general. And I don't, I would never necessarily call somebody who can produce as much as he has successfully in the playoffs a regular season type player. But I think teams don't fight over screens and get so, quite so hyper twitchy during the regular season grind as they do in the playoffs on defense. You know, some guy in the regular season, I'm thinking, like, you know, say you're on a road trip and it's like stay on step when he's off the ball, but you've also got a flight in two hours, two games on another coast in two days. You don't really slam screens or keep hands up as much. And then I think when you ramp things up 
in the playoffs. And then to bring it back to Raptors specific too, you get a guy like Van Fleet who had, has been picking up people at full court since he was at Wichita State, right? Um, and you could see how they kept him in to start the second half on several occasions, Van Vliet, because Curry was the focal point and was playing well. And so I think, I, I think Steph's amazing, and he changes the game. I think, I think he's changed the game more than anything just by the attention he draws. When you can see there was a couple times, if you guys saw – you know, and they they called one out. The announcers did. They were like, he drew a double team off the ball coming around a pin screen, and he he was off the ball. You know, and it's amazing what he does. But I do I do think sometimes that, and I think that's why they added Durant um, when they won the seventy three games, but couldn't couldn't mess wrestle through LeBron. I mean, you can a lot of the time, but couldn't because once the playoffs comes, people people don't die on screens nearly as much in the playoffs. So he doesn't get as get the looks that he often does. Yeah. All right, Greg. Off to you. I I know you want to weigh in a little bit on on, on Steph Curry as well. What do you what, what do you got to say? Yeah, I do think you know the the big thing about Steph that he'll never be able to overcome is is he is susceptible to physicality, like like Blair was saying. So it makes a lot of sense that playoff basketball would be harder for him in in that regard. I mean, at the same time, it's amazing how much he's still able to get his shot off even despite the fact that he's oftentimes the most sort of thin guy on the court uh the the stat that i was looking for was that uh he's the only person in nba history um to not make a a shot in the final 40 24 seconds of the fourth quarter oh nope not nba history since okay potential go ahead Field goal attempts in playoffs, final four, 24 seconds of the fourth quarter slash overtime since 2001. Um, Steph Curry is 0 for 9. Um, he's the uh-huh. only one that hasn't made a shot in nine attempts of the list. Um, field goal percentages are pretty bad. Kobe Bryant is 4 for 15 in that, situ- in that situation, 26%. Uh, KD is 4 for 13, 30%. Manu Ginobili, 4 for 12, 33%. Paul Pierce, 4 for 12, 33%. Tim Duncan, 2 for 9. James Harden, 1 for 9. So it's really hard to make last-second shots in uh, potential go-ahead go shots in the, in the end of the fourth quarter or overtime. But he's the only one out of that group that hasn't made uh, a go-ahead shot in the last 24 seconds of fourth quarter or overtime. LeBron James, speaking to his greatness and how much we – almost fail to appreciate it. He's made nine of 21 attempts uh, to wow. put his team ahead in the last 24 seconds. Wow. This 40, is, this is, this is in, 43% in the playoffs. In the playoffs. Wow. Yep. yep. And three of them blowing, one game against the Pistons. <laughs> I mean, he's, <laughs> he's, he's blowing everybody else out of the water. So LeBron James is, is amazing. So. And that number could be even higher if uh, J.R. Smith just uh, <laughs> passed, passed, passed up the ball. Can, can, on, I ask guys, can I ask guys for a sec quick? Did anybody else notice or remember how sexy and crazy the inbounds play was on that shot to Steph at the end of the game? Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't believe they went cross court on that. Over Draymond Green's head. He yeah. has to catch the ball over his head, but then Steph is wide open. It was a crazy. He had a great look. He had a great yeah, look. I had a feeling they'd been saving that up all year too, and I thought I thought they were throwing it away. Well, I mean, I, I want to just go back. It was a, it was a great play, I thought, and uh, I thought they were very fortunate to get the ball back. I mean, it was. It, I don't know if I say it was aggressive or it was an interesting decision to not foul the Raptors in that at the end of Game Six there and to to, to really try and trap and force uh, a turnover. They were very fortunate to get the turnover um, and. You know, it, it it almost worked for them, although I don't think they would have won uh, Game Seven. But to your your point about shots in the fourth quarter in the playoffs, I have a stat that I've been holding on to for a while, and that was in across his entire career, both playoffs and regular season, since he entered the league in 2007, Kyle Lowry is two for 30 on go-ahead field goals in the final 20 seconds of a game. No hmm. player, wow. no player. With at least eight attempts, <laughs> has shot worse than Kyle Lowry uh, since that time. <laughs> and I, we love I, you, Kyle. 
And I happen to think that Golden State may have been aware of that when they at, at the end of Game Five, in the same way that uh, you know Toronto was aware of Andre Iguodala's three point shooting uh, at the at the end of Game Two. So I mean, just to, but listen, guys, make shots. Kyle Lowry, I want, and the reason why I want to use that as a segue is because you know Kyle Lowry made huge shots to, to start off game six. He came out gunning, and I really think that he was a difference maker uh, for game six. I don't think the Raptors win game six without Kyle Lowry, and I don't think they win a title without Kyle Lowry, and Kawhi Leonard was incredible. I mean, absolutely MVP, uh, one of the top five, maybe, uh, all-time performance for playoffs. If we talk about the, end of the shot to win uh, game seven against Philly, his ability to shut down and change the, shut down Giannis and uh, and, and change the Milwaukee series, his, uh, his individual performances throughout Golden State, throughout the, the series to keep his team in it, to drag them along. But he did look, I mean, I mean, he did look a little bit burnt out as we got to game to the end of game five and, and, and in game six itself. And I, and I think that other guys stepped up and it was huge. Uh, Kawhi, 732 points across the playoffs, top three all time. Uh, the only players to ever score more in a playoffs are uh, LeBron last year. Uh, where he scored, I think, a dozen more points. And then, of course, the all-time record belongs to uh, the 92 Jordan. So, I mean, that's what we're talking about when you talk about the offensive play of Kawhi Leonard in these particular playoffs. And I think that's a good way to now to talk about Kawhi and about this particular team. I thought what we might do, guys, is a chance to sort of run down through the, re- the remainder of, of, of this podcast and sort of go through this, the season that was or the season that's to be. It's just to take a little bit, look at the at the, the Raptors roster and talk about some of the players themselves, where they are and, uh, you know, what they look like. I mean, for, for next year, we know that uh, Marc Gasol and Kawhi Leonard have player options. Each one are owed over $20 million. Um, I don't expect Kawhi Leonard to opt in, in, into his player option and instead to become a free agent where he will earn, you know, 30 plus million dollars. Marc Gasol probably stays on at 25 million. So let's start. We'll, we'll leave letter to last because he's the biggest name. Let's start with Gasol. What are your thoughts on Marc Gasol? And uh, you know, just having maybe uh, having him around for for one more year. But your thoughts on uh, Marc Gasol's addition to his team and his play this year, Blair? To you. Um, I agree with you. I think he'll take a player option. One, I think he's really enjoyed the situation here. Um, I think as as a more international citizen, he probably was drawn to Toronto in that regard too. Um, and I don't know, he's played great and been almost like a glue guy at times on defense in these playoffs, but I don't know that he gets that money anywhere else right now based on his just conventional drop-off in production since the trade. Um, and, but I think the Raptors would be great to have him. I think he is like, it seems as though from the outside looking in that he's already become an easy, quick part of the kind of veteran core in terms of stability, mentally, um, the all like being one of the consummate professionals. And that's one of the things that I think most about this team too, is when they went seven deep in these playoffs, even Van Vliet, despite being an undrafted free agent, um, all of them are consummate professionals, and I think Gasol fits right into that. I wonder if like that puts him and Ibaka at pretty expensive deals right now, but I'm not sh- I'm not sure what they do about that. But but yeah, it'll yeah, be interesting. So- see, it'll be interesting to see Gasol play a full season if he does as a Raptor too, because he he spoke at numerous occasions throughout the season that passed the trade about taking time and having a bit of a difficulty adjusting. You know, you mentioned Abaka. This is a good one. We'll, we'll, we'll go to you in just one second, Mike, on this. The Raptors this year, I think, were the fourth highest payroll in the league, 136 million approximately, uh, at least according to uh, the interweb. And uh, they're already on the books next year for again 130 million, and that's without uh, that's with Kawhi on the books for for 21. I mean, if he reups, it'll be it'll be more than that. So the, uh, you can expect them to be paying a little bit of money, but fifth, but. Approximately 50 million of that will be uh, Gasol and Ibaka, both set to make over 20 million next year. Um, but let's talk about their, uh, and then they both come off the books in 2020, 2021, 20, uh, when no one's under contract actually for that for that year, other than uh, Powell uh, and UOB at Siakam. There are no other contracts on the books for the Raptors currently for uh, uh, 2020, 2021. Uh, so, Mike, Ibaka and Gasol, what are your thoughts on just their? Their addition to the team this 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 particular season, this particular playoff run, and uh, you know going forward. 
uh, I think the Marcus Ole trade was the, the trade that really put them over the top. Uh, and you, you saw it in the playoffs that although he might not have hit the, the score sheet really high, lots of games, uh, you know, he only averaged nine points a game in the, in the playoffs, but uh, he played with a lot of, com- you know, composure. He was great on the screens, the physicality that he brought uh, to those screens um, and, you know, using him in, in pick and pop situations or, or screening to the basket. Um, I, I think he was, he was great. And that, and that defensive presence that, that he brought was, I think really, really important. You know, having a former defensive player of the year allows you to put a general on that floor to tell people where to go and what to do. Uh, and, and he played like that. And then you team him up with a guy like Serge Ibaka and, you know, we forget this, right. Cause he, he looks you know, much older than he actually is, but you know, Ibaka's only 29. He's younger than than Steph. He's younger than Durant. You know, he's he's a he's a young man still at, at 29 years old, and he can play that that same uh, setter position, but he brings a completely different uh, energy towards that. And uh, I I think having someone who can who can block the shots. Uh, who can who can make big shots? He, he made some big shots in in Game Five and Game Six. Um, so I, I think Ibaka uh, having the two of them together, it's a, it's a lot of money, but that that really anchors uh, that power forward center uh, position, depending on how you want to go with the team. And and we saw how successful the Raptors were when they just decided uh, to run Golden State out of the gym in a couple of occasions by putting Siakam and Ibaka. Uh, at the four and at the five and just, and, and going uh, just fast, just going fast and, and uh, as hard as they can. And, and what, how much, you know, that, that gave a golden state team that's, you know, not very speedy athletic uh, and how it just gave them fits. Uh, so I, I think going forward, the two of these guys together is going to be great. Well, I think definitely Mike, the, the injury to Durant, the injury to Looney, the injury to cousins um, was advantageous to Toronto uh, in that it, it allowed, uh, more space for Gasol and Ibaka to really step into and and be dominant players. And I think at different points in the series, in the finals, both Gasol and Ibaka took turns being dominant players. And uh, and that's part of the reason why Toronto wins. Greg, you're a big man. Uh, big man game. Uh, recognize big man game. What are your thoughts on uh, Gasol and Ibaka? Yeah, it was really cool to see it, for sure. Um, I thought the they were just so impactful. Like when they, when they made their mark, they really made their mark. Like for example, Pau Gasol or no, not Pau, sorry. Mark Gasol didn't score a ton of points, but this, the points he scored really, really mattered. You know what I mean? Like it, it really caused a big momentum shift when he had his points and just stepping up and hitting those threes. Like I said, I still don't feel like the Raptors had that, amazing number two option just because i don't think siakam is really there yet and i don't think lowry is quite talented enough i guess you'd say uh to be that really reliable number two option when it comes to playoff basketball so the fact that um two guys that are known as being very good but i think maybe we were sleeping on them stepped up and and filled in that role to help kind of do the number two by committee thing in the moments when you need it that it was just so so important i don't think they they went well i don't want to say i don't think they win that series without them that might be an overstatement but they were really impactful in in the moments they were on the court so that was really nice to see there's a lot of players that roll down the bottom of the bench uh Patrick McCaw, Jeremy Lin, Chris Boucher, Jody Meeks, Malcolm Miller. You know, and, and I, I know that there was some some trash talk on social media about like, oh, like who's this guy and and why is he getting a ring or stuff like that. Uh, for everybody out there who's like, oh, who's Chris Boucher? Why is he getting a ring? He's only there because he's Canadian or whatever. I mean, go let like, check out his this dude's story. Like he was basically working in a Saint Hubert, which is like a like a chain restaurant in uh, in, in uh, the province of Quebec, washing dishes um, just a couple years ago, and uh, and then this year. I mean, he's on the payroll for four hundred and fifty-seven thousand dollars. 
and he's got an NBA ring. So don't feel bad for Jody Meeks, folks. He made 320 grand last year with the Toronto Raptors, and uh, and that and that's uh, that's some pretty good cabbage. But if we look forward to, like I said, to to, to what what's taking place and what's what's happening with the Raptors' salary, I mean, OG Annual we didn't even play in the uh, in, in the playoffs. You got him for the next couple of years still. Uh, I mean, he, he's still on his rookie contract. You got Pascal Siakam. He's still on his rookie contract. They're and they'll love that deal in two years. That deal is yeah. going to be so good. <laughs> Yeah, 2020, 2021, I mean, the team will have a, a $3.5 million option. So in that 2020 uh, free agent market, the rappers will go into that, assuming let, – let's pretend Kawhi stays, right? And this is why I'm going to say this, because if, if he stays, this team legitimately next year can go for a second – second title i think with the the combination of players they have under contract having just won it what the east looks like the competition level of it what the west looks like even with ad teaming up with lebron and then there's a real position to to completely retool around Kawhi and go for it again in 2020 2021 if they want to again only players under contract at that point will be norm powell for 10 million and then you got annual and siakam on on their rookie deals and everybody else comes off at the end of next year at a free agent market that will include, believe it or not, DeMar DeRozan, uh, Mike Conley. I know my, my brother Mike loves him. Gordon Hayward. Draymond will be an unrestricted free agent as well. So there will be opportunities to, to, to retool at that point. Uh, I guess the question is uh, that I want to ask is, like, you know, we talked a lot about Lowry along the way. Lowry's got next season, is his last year on the deal, making over $30 million. Uh, which is what, are you, what are your thoughts on, on Kyle Lowry? Blair, we'll go to you. Um, well... Let me say first, you mentioned it earlier. Uh, I've, I've been watching. Um, I've been watching the finals on television since the Lakers and Pistons were winning in the late '80s. I've seen them all, and I can't recall anybody coming out in a finals game more like a house on fire than Lowry did in Game Six. Uh, the, the shots that he hit in the rapid succession that he did them, it was it was crazy. And <clears throat> and I agree with Greg that uh, you don't necessarily win that game without Kyle Lowry. And I even felt like that quick explosion he had at the start of the game gave them that little foothold that they just never really gave back up. Every time Golden State would push back in, they'd answer. But it was like that quick 11 points, like right, bam. That was like Golden State never got back from that. Um I mean, they made it close, but I mean, it just felt like momentum-wise, the Raptors had it and then just kept hanging on and hanging on. Um, I think I, it would be interesting to see with Lowry, especially because of what his price tag would be and stuff. It seems really hard for Toronto to let him go, although we know that if Ujiri is still the GM, he's pretty good at that when need be to let players go when he thinks it's necessary. Um, Nick Nurse called him emotionally unflappable, Lowry, and I do think he's such a huge part of this team it's going to be i'd be pretty surprised if he ends up somewhere else but again i i don't know that i'd want to pay kyle lowry this the same amount of money again but but he's he's clearly especially even just the parade the parade in toronto that uh happened today i mean you he 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 was based he basically had the trophy almost the whole time and i'm sure that was deliberate and i'm sure nobody minded um, so it's hard it's hard to just get rid of people like that that seem to be such a core personality. And when Nurse called him emotionally inflappable, he was also referring to it not just as Lowry, but as the core identity of the roster. He said that after game six. Yeah, he's a, the, the longest serving Raptor. No, you know, he's been here seven, seven which seasons. Is, which no is ironic. Yeah, which is ironic because in my opinion, frankly, until this season, I often found, found him to be an Achilles heel of the team in a lot of ways. But he's... The way they've built around him and started to change and minimize his roles in certain areas has really played to his favor. Mike, well, what, what are your thoughts on uh, on, on, on Kyle Lowry? Uh, I, I'm going to piggyback on uh, what Blair just said about how you know we, we've done a lot of um, critical discussion on Kyle Lowry over the years. Um, but you know, once, once you win championships, you know, it erases a lot of your, your flaws. And we saw that with players like Paul Pierce, you know, and, and Chauncey Billups and others over the years, um, uh, that once you start winning championships, everything sort of, you know, looks a little bit better for you. Um, and I, I agree Kyle Lowry, like a bat out of hell in game six, I believe he scored 15 or 18 in that first quarter. He was just, he was unbelievable. And he, he kept the, the Raptors sort of looked out of place, uh, well, you know, but he kept them emotionally going, and he's been that emotional player 
uh, his, his whole career. And, you know, at, at 32, he'll be 34 when this ends. You know, you can't pay him that amount of money uh, anymore. And I think you're going to start seeing the drop off um, in his ability um, going forward. So I, I think, you know, Lowry has done a wonderful service to the Toronto Raptors over the years. Um, and maybe if anything else, it, when he got shoved by that Golden State owner and he decided that this wasn't the time or place to turn this into the malice part two, um, that was, you know, I, I think something that shows to, you know, his, his character uh, and his maturity that he's, that he's grown up uh, over these past few years. So he's, he's a, he's a good little player, but can we find a better point guard? Absolutely. Should we pay him another $30 million? Absolutely not. Uh, and I, I think if they can get him back on the cheap to help uh, bring up the next level of, uh, of point guard, whenever we decide to get that, then I think that would be okay. But I, I don't see him being a Raptor beyond the next two years. Okay. Greg, uh, t- to you on Kyle Lowry. Yeah. I mean, you obviously love him as a person and as a leader and, and all that. Um, I would never advocate for someone not taking what they're worth in terms of their market value, but it would be great if he, in a couple of years, you know, took a little team loyalty discount to, to stay with the team, but help them retool in, in smart ways. So I would love to see that. Um, a couple things about Kyle Lowry. Uh, one, I think he has like the most infectious smile in the league. And that's one thing I really like about him. Like when he smiles, you really feel it. And um, I don't know. That's something I love about him and the team is just um, that infectious smile that he has. So that's, you know, from a quality of enjoying the Raptors play, like that's something he's just so likable in the, in that kind of way. Um, he just seems like a, a really good person. And like what, like Mike said, the, the character and the decorum he showed when he was shoved um, to be the bigger person, but still not let, not let the guy get away with it at the same time was, was really admirable. Um, so yeah, that was, that's great. I, I think he's, I love everything about him except for his high end potential in playoff basketball, essentially. Um, Another thing about Lowry is um, I kind of think that um, DeMarcus Cousins should have brought bought him a Father's Day card because in game six, he absolutely sunned him all over the court. Uh, <laughs> he was literally toying with him and yeah. having a hard time not laughing at it. Like he had to hold back his smile at how much he was torching DeMarcus Cousins and like, yeah, I'm kind of used to being critical of Kyle Lowry from focusing a lot of what he can't do. But, I mean, he he made a fool out of DeMarcus Cousins, and that was, like, funny to watch in Game 6. The uh, I thought the best line from, the, from the, the, the championship parade was when Danny Green had the microphone, and he referred to himself as the other guy in the trade. And, uh, you know, and... Part of that's a little bit true. He was the other guy in the trade that brought Kawhi to Toronto. And he actually even uh, admitted – he said to his teammates, thanks for, you know, putting up with me when I wasn't making shots, you know, and I didn't play very well, which I thought was also pretty pretty humorous. I, I, I like a lot about his personality and uh, just sort of the person that he is. But he's the only guy from the, from, from the team that, that just won the title that uh, – with the exception of, of, of Kawhi, uh, who, who turned on his player option to become a free agent, who isn't under contract for next season. So, I mean – there's already talk of, of LA Lakers having an interest in a shooter like Danny Green, uh, given their Anton, the, uh, the Anthony Davis deal that they just made. So wanted to put some, some some shooters around there. But I mean, assuming that Danny Green stays or goes, the rest of this team is constructed as is, and that brings us then to the final two players to talk about. I mean, there's Norman Powell, and then we'll we'll close with Kawhi. So uh, Norm Powell, uh, sorry, I already talked about Norm Powell. Fred Van V. That's what I wanted to talk about. I want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you know, that's my UCLA bias. I just keep looking down at my sheet and say, play for UCLA. <laughs> Let's talk about them again. Uh, yeah, Freddie Van, Van Vliet. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I, did, I didn't think 
he could be the, a big shot maker. And I, I think I'm on record even in a podcast about having said that, or maybe it was just in our chat room of saying, you know, I don't feel good about going into the trying to win a title with, with, with him as, as being your guy off the bench that you need to, sh to, to hit threes. So uh, he, he made the big shots. Uh, th thoughts on, on, uh, on, on Fred Van Viet is, I mean, what can, what, what can you say about him? Greg? Had my mute on. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, no, I I'm right there with you. I didn't think he I didn't think he had the game changing potential that he showed in the in the playoffs and the finals, and he showed proved to be indispensable from a defensive, from a toughness perspective, from a def defense perspective, from a shot making perspective. So yeah, he totally he totally shocked me. I love his story. I love his loyalty to Rockford, Illinois, the whole thing. So I would be lying completely if I said I knew he had that level of game-changing performance in him. Mike? Uh, you know what? For the first half of these playoffs, the Vlambeet was exactly what we sort of were feeling. Like, we were scared. He wasn't hitting any shots. He was 0 for 18 and three-point shots, I think, at one point. Um, and then it all clicked, right? He had another child and bam, Fred Jr. is born. And all of a sudden he remembered that the ball goes in the basket and he remembered that you got to keep your guy in front of you. And he became uh, a completely different player that was so much more focused. Uh, and then he started knocking down those, those big three point shots. And he was, he was great at, at the defensive end of the floor. Uh, and he was someone that you could rely on for, you know, lots of minutes, um, you know, and he, he ended up averaging almost, I think, 25 or 26 minutes a game throughout uh, the rest of the playoffs at that point. So, you know, he was he was leaned on very heavily and he responded in a way that I don't think any of us were really prepared for, but very, very happy that he actually did. Blair. Um, I think I think Danny Green deserves some of the credit, too, because I think some of Van Vliet's uh, increase in minutes and at least until the finals where he was a lot played a lot for defense was partially because. It was hard to keep Green on the floor. He was playing so poorly. Um, uh, I like Van Vliet a lot. I think I think there's always, when you're a guy who's not really creating your own shot and you benefit once the team starts ping-ponging the ball around and you get some open looks and you're as hard a worker as he is reportedly off the court with his shot and also just a hard worker on defense all the time, I think you'll eventually find your shot. I don't know if I just consider it some weird kind of karma or just law of averages or what and i think that was happened for him i also have a weird theory or maybe it's not weird but just having the kid and everything and i haven't steve i know you have but uh friends that have friends that have and just the sense you know i think sometimes you just start to overthink things when you're slumping and then you not just the kid but you're not sleeping much you're tired and you're just going out there and focusing on playing hard and working and maybe you just kind of stop thinking about your shot and then it comes back. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's kind of what other feeling I got. I just have one question too, though. When he took that huge hit to the face and uh, you guys watched and half his tooth came out, I just want to call out the ESPN team because how can they be seeing that there's half a tooth there and there's a five minute break and nobody stands up anywhere on the camera crew, Mike Breen or Van Gundy, they don't stand up and go, Hey, yo, somebody get that guy's tooth. Well, yeah, that's, 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 that's an interesting shout. I didn't think we were going there, but yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> I just blew my mind. I was like, a lip cream going, somebody tell them the tooth's there. <laughs> I wonder if he got it back. And I think but you, but you mentioned his toughness, you know, his hustle. I mean, Canadians, Torontonians, I mean, we we just love those types of players. It's the reason why, I mean, uh, JYD was a legend here for, for so many years. I mean, we just, we, we, we just, we love guys who, who fit that mentality. Darcy Tucker with the Maple Leafs was a, was a similar type of player. You don't even have to have elite level talent, but you got elite level hustle. You become endeared to the fans here. And I think the stitches and the tooth knocked out just even added more to that. Uh, Freddie Van Vliet, I think, is, is going to be a loved athlete in Toronto for a very long, long time. All right, let's close up the claw. There's only one man. Uh, I mean, that really did. I don't know what's left to say about him uh, other than really just the best player in the world right now. Uh, 
it was largely because LeBron wasn't playing in, in the playoffs. But even uh, having said that, uh, I think that Kawhi Leonard is the best athlete to ever wear a jersey in the city of Toronto. And the only person that, in, in my lifetime, and the only person that I've seen that's even remotely close at this point, I think is Roberto Alomar. Uh, for the when the Toronto Blue Jays were the best baseball team in the world, and even then, I'm not sure that uh, anything is even close. I mean, the display that he put on this season, especially during the playoffs, and the way in which he conducted himself and took this team to the next level, I just I've never seen anything like it. Will he stay or will he go? We don't know. Um, if he stays, I think the team's positioned to win a second uh, title, at least challenge for it. If he goes uh, within. 12 months, the Raptors will be ready to completely rebuild because everybody's coming off the books. So I, I don't think they're actually in that bad a position either way. And I think if Kawhi goes, I think Masai goes as well. Uh, so, I mean, we'll probably look at, at, at a regime change. Not sure what's about to come, uh, but what I will say is it's been absolutely spectacular and I've enjoyed every single minute of it. Greg, let's go to you. What do you, what do you have, what, what's left to say about Kawhi Leonard? The only thing I could say about Kawhi Leonard is you know, if he leaves, there should be no ill will in Toronto. You know, he gave you a championship. Um, he seemed to be really liked by his teammates. You can't say he slacked. So I hope he stays. Um, he's certainly loved by the city, and it's been proven that he can win in Toronto. Uh, I think Kawhi has the highest winning percentage of any player in NBA history with at least 400 games played. So um, he's proven to be a winner throughout his entire career. And I, I respect the hell out of him. And for me, he's definitely number one in the league overall right now. Mike. Uh, what, what else can you say about Kawhi Leonard other than, you know, he was the best player this year and the best player in the world. I don't think you can say anything other than that. And, you know, if, if he goes Raptors fans, you don't just, for what it was, you could just bask in the, in the glory of knowing that you got the best player in the world. He came here for one year, totally revamped it and won a championship. Um, and if he leaves, then, you know, it's, it's time to retool, but you know, at, at the beginning of when the trade was first done, you knew there was the possibility of him going and uh, that you only really had him as a rental player. Uh, and I, I think you just had, you, I hope that people had, had looked at it similarly to that, that, you know, he's probably going to go at the end of the year. And if he does, then, you know, hopefully we'll get something good out of him. And we did. Uh, so just, we, we got the championship. And if he comes back, I think like you said, Steve, we got a real good chance of, of winning a championship because players and free agents will take pay cuts to pay to play on championship teams and on teams they think that they can uh, win a championship with. Uh, just look at what Boogie Cousins did, right? So, uh, and we've we've seen this all the time: players taking discounts to go and play on teams that uh, can make deep runs in the playoffs. And I think you would find the same thing if Kawhi stays here. You'll find players willing to. Uh, to come here uh, this year or not, if not this year, next year when we have more players off the books. So um, I, you know, I'll go out on a limb. I'm, I'm going to say that I think Kawhi is going, I don't think he's going to stay after all of this. Um, that just doesn't seem to be part of his personality. Um, so, but if he, if he stays, I'll be, I'll be pleasantly surprised, but I, I, I think he's out the door, but I'm, I'm very thankful for what he brought to Toronto. Blair. Um, I, th I thought Kawhi was the best two-way player in the league before Jaja Pachulia, Bruce Bolandum. Um, and now he's taken his offensive uh, level. He's, he's now an elite offensive player that can take over a game at any time. And it, it, he's just, he's graceful to watch. His size is just looks like the way you'd build a deadly basketball body in the lab. Just his proportions, his size. Something about his shot, I don't know if anybody else notices, I find his jumper is so slow and easy, and it has such small bounce off of the rim all the time. It almost looks like it's going slower towards the net. There's just so much grace in the guy's game. I I hope he stays, and I'm not even a diehard Raptors fan. I'll tell you what, I think he has, to a large degree, already decided or already knew what he was going to do to begin with. Um 
And that means to me, if he goes, he goes because of that. Because if you're thinking about basketball and making a basketball decision, you just came to this team. You were at your load managed. I still think his knee should be a bigger story. I want to know how much it's been diminished or what that what's going on there. But anyway, you had your load managed. You've only had one year with this team. You only played half a year with Marc Gasol. And you made Joel Embiid cry. You made Giannis and Atutokounmpo flummoxed at the end of their series, looked like he might start to cry. And then you took the dynasty and slayed that. Where else are you going to go? It's a pretty good situation. And Siakam, for the deal, like the money they're paying him, you're going to have a hard time finding a young up-and-coming wingman to pair with, too. So I would hope he stays uh, in that case. But, you know, you never know. I think he might go. And if that does happen, I'll be curious to see if any other GMs start trying to do this, um, putting every, pulling all the chips to the table just to try and grab a championship for one year, and we'll figure out the rest later, later once the city loves us for it. All very interesting takes. Thank you very much to the World Wide Roundtable, Blair Miller, Mike Gennaro, uh, Greg Mason. I mean, it's been fun to, to chat with you guys again and to, and to do this. Of course, after a long hiatus, we had the chance to come back to, through the finals and just run a couple podcasts with you, and it's been, it's been good times. Thanks to Rappers Republic, who's also given us this forum and the chance to do it as well. There's been some rumors that maybe next season we might uh, put together a little something and, and, and appear more frequently. If that's the case, we'll let you know and, and certainly uh, be back in touch. But just some closing thoughts on, on, the, on the season as a whole and the moment uh, that, that has just passed. So thanks to the World Wide Roundtable. Uh, you're listening to PhD Steve. The doctor is in on RaptorsRepublic.com. You know, I'm, I'm a man in my 40s and growing up uh, in my house, uh, I didn't see my father cry very often. In fact, I have really only one memory of ever actually seeing my father uh, cry as a young child. Uh, my dad was sitting uh, out on the lawn in, in tears after learning, hearing of the death of uh, one of his friends. And uh, I remember asking my mom what was wrong with my dad as she explained to me the situation because you know, the era that I grew up in, dads didn't cry. Um, two days ago, my father WhatsApped me. Uh, he didn't know what WhatsApp was and is not the most technically sound person, but uh, technologically sound person, but found a way to WhatsApp me so we could have a face-to-face conversation. And in that face-to-face conversation, he told me he had been waiting days to speak with me. Of course, I'm in Australia and he's back in Toronto since the moment that last shot went in because uh, he just he couldn't explain the feelings of happiness that he had, and he didn't have to because as he was talking to me, he actually began to cry, <laughs> and uh, and that's really what this title is about, folks. It's not about basketball. It's not even about sport. It's not about the economic impact that it has on a city by bringing money to restaurants and bars and servers and workers to Uber drivers or to uh, shop owners. What it's about is it's about what sport can do for a community and what it can do for a family, and the way that it can bring people together to transcend the ordinary and the everyday that makes up their lives. And yes, it's the, the win to, of, of the Raptors winning is about so much more. It's about justification, vindication for, for Canada, for Canadians. It's not, it, it really has very little to do <laughs> with what happened on the court. And Canadians can't re- yet put it into words, uh, and there will never be another moment like this again. And, but, you know, the this is a moment where we, we appear. That's why we come to sport. We come to sport for those feelings that are more, even, even more than we can describe in words. So on behalf of the World Wide Roundtable, Robert and Public, and everybody else out there, thanks so much for, for downloading and listening to The Doctor is In. And uh, until next time, whatever that is, be nice to each other and your bus drivers. Peace. I don't know. Either I'm off my nut or he is. Or you are. Is that your final answer? Damn, I'm good! Can you feel that? Huh? Can you feel it, Captain Compost? I can hardly contain myself. You know, before this is over, I'm gonna need a whole lot of serious therapy. Man, I'm tired of being right. Whoa! Inconceivable!